تلعب على طول اقطعها ماجد عبد الغني توصل لمختار مختار 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 ماشي تتلعب لزكريا راس من رجل مين جنبها جول الجول الاول للنادي الاهلي جول جول الجول الاول للنادي الاهلي زكريا ناصف بيلعب قنبله في الزاويه اليمين بيجيب الجول الاول للنادي الاهلي وباقي حسب ساعتي انا نص دقيقه نص دقيقه وزكريا ناصف يلعب قنبله على يمين عادل مامور ويجيب الجول الاول للنادي الاهلي In giving Al Ahli Sporting Club victory over their nemesis Zamalek Sporting Club, this goal was very meaningful. Yet the heartbreaking goal for the Zamalekawiya fans was also completely meaningless in the sense that the win didn't really assure the Al Ahli club any great advantage or success for the season. Neither did it hamper Zamalek in attaining an improved position in the league. The only real and tangible meaning this goal provided was to whom the bragging rights would belong to following this particular head-to-head -head meeting. If you aren't aware, this football rivalry between Al Ahli and Zamalek is one of the world's wildest and most intense. Emotions run high, and it's at these moments when passion easily overcomes reason. And here is where our story starts, at an intimate gathering of 12, when multiple generations of a Kyrian family habitually come together every instant the two most successful clubs in African history meet. Throughout the last century, a reality of the Egyptian footballing fandom is that many families have their loyalties divided between these two clubs. In this specific gathering, two of the 12 family members are staunch supporters of Zamalek, while the other majority of 10 are committed Al Ahli loyalists. All supporters, young and old, followed on attentively with this engaging and dramatic roller coaster of an event. Upon the final whistle by the Italian referee, bragging rights were secured by the 10 Ahlawiya fans. And so, in the intimate living room that was so peaceful less than two hours before, the relentless bombardment of insults towards the Zamalek team and its fan base was about to explode. This match, though, was slightly different. The drama, as it had unfolded throughout the game and the way in which victory was snatched, infused so much raw emotion, stress, and tension for all those enduring its events. It was dead even, score-wise, till the very last second. A neutral result would have postponed any bragging rights and resultant emotional damage for many weeks. But it was not meant to be, and those who were victorious needed an immediate outlet to vent. From the victor's perspective, it was now absolutely acceptable to rip apart their rivals, as had been done onto them in the past, when it was their turn to experience gut-wrenching loss. Without any show of respect, endless demeaning words would echo throughout the living room. No manners were left unbroken, regardless of age and elderly status. The losing fans were taking it hard, enduring animosity and rudeness, ridiculed in front of other family members. It was acceptable to behave so uncompassionately by the victors. Yes, for the winning fans it was justifiable, until it wasn't any longer. The elder of the two Zamalek fans stood up, tall and proud, and stated, Enough! This has gone on beyond any form of disrespect. We are being humiliated in what I used to consider a house like my own. We are leaving. And for one full year beyond that moment, when Al Ahli overcame Zamalek by one goal to nil due to a last second strike, a family that was once so close, respectful, and loving towards each other grew immediately distant and broke apart due to their self perceived humiliation. This connection would be total. Apologies would immediately be attempted, but would fail. Only time would eventually heal these wounds. How does something like this happen? How do any devout Muslim fans, as were Al Ahli fans attending this family gathering, allow themselves the right to embarrass their family members, one of whom was a family senior member, an elder who was a father figure to all of the Al Ahli fans? even if the taunting was done assuming the context of jest. Where did all the teachings of Islam disappear to? Respecting your elders and never raising your voice at them. The Al Ahli fans were all taught better. But did jubilation over a meaningless result demand such antipathy? Not only were Muslims' teachings disobeyed, 
but the cultural traditions that Middle Easterners hold so dear, that of the filial relationships cherished so deeply and pridefully held so high, were also guiltlessly shattered. So again, let's ask the same question. How did something like this happen? Life is hard, and when it's very hard, it is usually void of hope and foreseeable elation and success. And for many on this earth, what do they do? They look for these positive feelings and aspirations elsewhere, in associations and belongings to external things, people or groups, that offer this type of hope, excitement and camaraderie. For many around the world, this belonging comes in the form of sport consumption and the almost innate connections established with a local sports team as fans. And for a significant percentage of these people, it is their only outlet to a cyclical reality when life is reborn at the beginning of every season and with it an opportunity towards justifiable purpose and fulfillment that can be attained through the highly skilled actions and potential successes of their team. Simply put, the relationships they have with their sports team and fellow fan brethren is their primary life. Everything takes second place when it's game time. Nothing is taken for granted. Families and friends don't exist or easily take a back seat. Only the allegiance and absolute loyalty to their club or team is real. All actions and existence outside the sporting experience strictly serves the purpose of being able to live life fully as a numbed sports fan. No family member, not even an elder, could avoid the wrath of such a victorious rival. It is very disconcerting that this phenomenon exists at such a grand scale. It is further troubling when we see this behavior as common and acceptable in the Middle East, when loyalties to a team and its supporter base trump the deeper connections of family and religious edicts or traditions. Sport is fun. Sport is also business. But sport is definitely not life. That is the real disconnect that has haunted us over the last 60 years, and one that we still see today when fans lose their humanity when confronting an opposing fan base, triggered by a concoction of familiarity and hatred. Unfortunately, as much as it is about how parents wrongfully condition their children to hold certain antagonistic beliefs and sentiments from an early age, it is also the culture that is promoted by the clubs themselves that condones such behavior. The media as well doesn't help with their various narratives created explicitly to feed the fires of aggression and trigger animosity between rivaling factions, all with the sole purpose of increasing their ratings and revenue. So what do we do? How do we overcome the exhilarated sentiments that lead to cold-hearted, demeaning words projected at our defeated enemy? How do we stay human by separating what happens during wins and losses and upon the referees announcing the end of the game? we consciously go back to who we are, decent and well-mannered human beings. The bottom line is, empathy is a gift we owe each other.